This is our last unit in the course, social psychology. It's all about, you know, how we explain, how we think about others, how people affect situations and how groups work together. Okay, we're going to work through this. It contains some of the most uh, controversial and most talked about experiments there are in psychology, which actually change how we look at ethics when we do psychological research. Okay, this is a good unit. Make sure you pay attention to it because they always make sure that the last unit, there's something on it, something about it on that AP exam. Okay, so here we go with social psychology starting right now. We begin our journey into social psychology. We're going to start looking at attributions, attitudes, and actions. Here are the learning outcomes. Make sure you know what it is we're looking for. First of all, when we look at social psychology, the definition is basically the scientific study of uh, about how we influence, how we relate to others, and how we think about others. Okay, so that's kind of the whole gist of it, but it covers so many exciting things like, you know, your influence in a situation. It covers, you know, how, how does racism happen, liking and loving, and all those kinds of things. So we first look at attribution. And what attribution is, when you attribute something, we're giving a root cause to it. So when someone has a certain kind of behavior, we will attribute that behavior to something, usually either the disposition of the person, which is their personality. You know, we may think that they are a great person, and so that's why they behave the way they did. Or we could give it a situational attribution, meaning that uh, it was the situation that that person was in that made them behave that way, not not. Uh, you know, we're differentiating between the person themselves and actually the situation they're in. We tend to give dispositional explanations to other people's behavior, especially when it's bad. Uh, for example, many of you have just learned to drive, and I'm sure you've been in a situation where you've had somebody cut you off. So when they cut you off, you probably get upset with that person. You think, oh my God, that person is such a... Okay, but you've also probably been in a situation where you've cut someone else off and you don't sit there and go, oh my God, I am such a <laughs> No, you probably think, oh, well, I had a lot on my mind. Um, there's something going on and I wasn't paying attention. I just need to smarten up and pay a little bit more attention. So in that case, the person that cut you off, you're giving them a dispositional explanation that they are the jerk that they are or that you think they are. And in your case, you're giving the situational attribution. We do this so often, we call this the fundamental attribution error, not giving enough credence to the situation that the person is in, which also in this case is a self-serving bias. If you remember this from a previous unit, uh, we tend to, when we, when we have behaviors we don't like that are bad, maybe we do poorly on a test, we tend to blame the situation and it makes us feel better about ourselves. But when we do things that are really good, like we do well on a test, then we actually will explain that behavior because we are good people and we've worked hard and we give ourselves a dispositional explanation. So we talk about attitudes and you know your, your attributions you have can change your attitudes. Uh, for example, you're driving, another driving example, and somebody has their high beams on you coming towards you. Uh, you may take that as this person's being a jerk, trying to blind you, so you hit your high beams and you blind them, which doesn't make much sense when you're traveling at high speeds on a highway where you can't see, so really a good idea to make it so they can't see. But if you just go, you know, well, that person's mind is on something else, and we give a situational attribution, you know, maybe they've had illness in the family, we don't know, um, then perhaps you will deal with the situation a lot differently. Uh, when we try to persuade people, our central root of persuasion is when we use logic and facts and the person responds to those types of of uh, informational items however a peripheral route is when we use things outside logic and everything else you know you think of advertisements on tv often we use uh, things like attractiveness or uh, people that are famous to influence our decisions and that is the peripheral route of persuasion Some ways that we change others, and there are others, and we'll mention some of them, but uh, one of the main ones is called a foot in the door phenomena. And what this means is if we smart with a small, start with a small request, we can usually build the, crest, the request um, until it is larger, what we want. So, for example, you want um, uh, to uh, borrow $100, so maybe you ask, 
hey, can I borrow $20? And when they do that, you say, oh, that's not quite enough. You know, would you mind giving me 100 And if you're like me, it never goes anywhere, but that does work in some situations. We see this in times at, at, at stores. Uh, we, we have some, say it's a suit store, a retail store, and somebody comes in and we have an item uh, that is a little bit smaller. We're more likely to to purchase that item if the other item is purchased. Say we buy a suit and we say, well, with that suit, here's the sweater and it's on sale for 30% off because you bought that suit. We're much more likely to buy that sweater after we've bought the suit. And many salespeople use these techniques. There, there are other techniques that are used and we'll talk about some of them in class. Um, this is the main one covered in your textbook. The role people are in has a lot to do with our behavior. You know, when we talk about situational behaviors, one of the most uh, well-known experiments that has some controversy around it is the Stanford Prison Experiment. Um, this was done by Philip Zimbardo, and it was during time he was tr at Stanford University. He wanted to see, you know, how much does the role influence a person? So what they did is set up a mock jail in the basement of the Stanford Psychology Department. They also got involved the Stanford Police Department or the Palo Alto P Police Department and they got them people to volunteer for a nominal amount of money for the experiment and they didn't know whether they're going to be guards or they're going to be prisoners in this mock prison so just from a flip of a coin they chose six people to be guards and six people to be prisoners in the original 12 people and what ensued later on when this happened, Philip Zimbardo thought at first this was going to be a really boring thing until one of the guards started to amp it up. And we had all kinds of situations where there was people that had mental breakdowns. Um, Philip Zimbardo himself actually made a mistake of making himself basically like the prison superintendent. And he started to see it as not as an experiment. And it actually got to the point where there was quite demeaning behavior happening. And the guards treated the prisoners very poorly and the prisoners treated the guards very poorly and he had to stop this experiment six days in when it was planned to be a two-week experiment um, we'll talk about how this came about and i'll show you a little film in class about it um, very influential but it is also a little bit controversial of how it happened you know would this play out um, if there were different personalities in there uh, one of the guards, which they referred to as John Wayne, because John Wayne was a tough cowboy kind of guy, kind of took on the role to be the bad guy and everybody else kind of followed along or or joined in, which, which really changed the whole atmosphere of the experiment. The other thing is when we call it an experiment, we're not really sure how we can identify, you know, what is the, an independent variable in this case. And because it's more of an observational thing where we put people into the into the this situation. Um, Abu Ghraib was a, a military prison in um, Iraq that the US um, controlled. And after the 9-11 attacks in New York, the whole world was basically on the side of defending you know, the United States. Yes, they've been hurt very badly and, and everybody supports them. Then there were some pictures that came out of Abu Ghraib. And you can look them up on the internet. Some of them are very, very um, disgusting and vile and it was basically the, the people in charge, the military guards in charge of the prison would humiliate, put these the Iraqi prisoners in you know in sexual positions, take pictures, pile them on top of one another, cover them in feces, um, do all kinds of things and takes pictures all the time while they are smiling you know and giving thumbs up and uh, things like that. When those pictures were leaked out, I believe it was through Al Jazeera television, um, then the world saw this and we saw okay well now the allies of the United States, their people are just as bad as the um, people that they're fighting against and how they treat their prisoners. Um, however, experiments or the, the recreation of the, the Stanford prison experiment, we saw very many similar things starting to happen when there wasn't the kind of guidance that was necessary to control those types of behaviors. You know, so the question is, will good people in a bad situation do bad things and that seems to be the case as shown by Philip Zimbardo. Whoops, sorry, I'm lost here. Where am I? There I go. So how do we, you know, change our attitudes? And one of the big things, this is a big concept, it's cognitive dissonance and make sure you understand this. And what this does is we strive to relieve the tension when we have two thoughts in our head or perhaps our actions go against 
our our attitudes that we have. Um, you know, simple examples, perhaps when we were younger, we were pressured to smoke by our peers. So we didn't want to smoke, which causes cognitive dissonance. Dissonance means it, there's there's opposing points of view, which causes tension. And so maybe we do try that cigarette. And then in our minds, because we've done it, we will try to shift our attitudes towards our behaviors in order to make them um, more acceptable to ourselves and explain our behaviors away. Okay, so there's lots of situations where this comes up. Anytime there are two different thoughts, we have to resolve that tension, especially if we do a behavior that goes against our beliefs and our attitudes, then often we will shift those attitudes and values towards the behavior that we have have just done. Now, conformity and obedience. Conformity and obedience is the next little section here. And we look at, you know, mimicry. How do we copy one another and why do we and when do we conform? You know, you think about conformity and everybody, you know, prides themselves on being individuals in our culture. However, you know, you look at the clothes people wear to your school or to, you know, in town or whatever, and it's definitely socially dictated. Everybody wears very much the similar kinds of, of clothes, and even those that wear different types are usually conforming to a group that they belong to. And we'll also look at one of the other experiments that was quite controversial as far as ethics goes. We have something called the chameleon effect, and what this is is um, when we're in a group and you do a behavior, someone else is going to do behavior. Think of yawning. When one person yawns, are you thinking about yawning right now? You might be. Every, lots of many other people will yawn as well. And we also find, um, you know, like there was an experiment done and they had people, confederates, that would sit in a group and they would shake their foot. And they noticed that when they shook their foot, many of the other people in the group would shake their feet, okay? Or that they would scratch their cheek then many of the people in the group would, chat, would scratch their cheek just copying that person. And if you think about it, and we, we like when people copy and repeat what we do, it's, it's a form of linkage and, and a, a form of becoming a group in society. Um, mood linkage also is the kind of thing, you know, when you're around happy people, you're going to be happy. When you're around sad people, you probably feel down and out and sad. And you can think of, you know, crimes where there are copycats. You, you guys may not remember, but you've probably heard of the school shooting in Columbine, um, Colorado. And two people who had been bullied went in and they, they shot up the school and, and killed a bunch of, of innocent people. The, um, after that, in the United States, every single state in the United States received threats um, in one of their schools that, that mimicked that crime. Uh, there was only one state that didn't. I believe it was Virginia. But one state had up to like 60 threats. And, you know, you think of, of we've learned now suicides, you know, often come in, in groups. So when it's a highly publicized suicide, it tends to create more suicides. This was kind of discovered when Marilyn Monroe had committed suicide. This is even before my time. Um, it increased the amount of suicides in that following month quite dramatically. So that's mood linkage. So conformity is going along with the group. The Solomon Ash study is a very famous study um, that was done where he did it in a college with college students. And basically they gave these... Uh, there was a battery of tests, but this is an example. They were given the standard lines. So they would have like five Confederates, or I can't remember the exact number of Confederates, but they would have a group of people that were in on the experiment, and the one person wasn't. And they were at the end, and they would give out verbal answers. And they wanted to see if everybody gave the wrong, the same wrong answer that were in on the experiment, what would the person that was unaware do? So they'll be sitting there, and when it comes to their term, it's fairly obvious in this. When you look at the standard line, it, number two matches. But... Everybody would say three in front of you. So when it comes to your turn, um, do you want to be right or do you want to fit into the group? And what he found in his research is even, you know, educated college students that it was disturbing to him. And about 30% of the people went along with the crowd, not giving the right answer. We, his experiments have been recreated later and we have found, you know, a little less conformity and but the conditions that really seem to strengthen it is if you feel co incompetent or insecure. So if you're incompetent amongst that group, if there's at least three people, we're more likely to conform. If the group is unanimous, for example, they all give the same wrong answer. 
if we admire the group status, if we really, you know, if we get, you know, think of your heroes and you get to sit around with them and they say something, you know, you're more likely to conform what they say rather than go against them. Or if you've had no prior commitment, you never really thought about it before, you might go along with the group. If other people are observing your behavior, you're more likely to go along with the group. So for example, in an election, uh, we usually have secret ballots because we don't want people to go along with the group. We want individuals' thoughts and ideas. And if one's culture strongly encourages respect for social standards, and we find this in collectivist countries where they value the group harmony and the group more than we do in Western society where we're more individualistic, they are more prone um, to situational influences as well as conformity. Why do we conform? There are reasons. There's a normative social influence, which basically means we don't want to stand out. We want to fit in with the group, so we go along with the group, so that we are part of it. The other one is informational social influence. So the harder the decision that you have to make, you're more likely to go along with the group, even though it may be the wrong answer, um, because you don't really know the answer. You're not 100% certain, so you're going to go. So you're getting information from the rest of the group, so you follow along with that. Okay, so those are the two big reasons for conforming. Normative, going along with the group, and information, you're not really sure, so you're getting information from the other people, so you go along with them. Obedience is when we follow orders. Milgram did an experiment that many of you are probably familiar with, where he uh, had this impressive machine. Um, you would walk into it, if you were the subject, you would walk into it, and they'd explain that they're doing a... Um, a uh, research on learning. One of you is going to be the teacher, one of you is going to be the learner, and they would give you know, randomly draw it. It looks like it's random, but it's not. It's fixed so that you become the teacher and the confederate is the learner. And then they would go into another room where they were hooked up to electrodes, and then you would ask them questions. And then if they got the answer wrong, you started at the left-hand side of the machine, which was a very small shock. But the machine was graduated all the way up into like very dangerous amounts of voltage and were actually labeled like XXX and not that kind of XXX. Okay, so this was basically like a lethal amount of, of um, electricity going through this person. And of course, the person on the other side was told to get them wrong. In fact, they used a tape recording, so it was the same every time, the same kinds of answers. And what we found, um, they actually, he actually polled, surveyed about 40 psychiatrists to predict how far they would go. All of them, including Milgram, believed uh, once the people started screaming in pain because they would act along um, complaining about heart problems and all this kinds of stuff, um, that most people would stop and certainly they would stop when they started to like actually really scream in agony. However, they were wrong. When this result was done, we found that over 60% of the people went all the way to the very end. Now, was this people that were thinking that it was... Uh, an experiment and it wasn't really giving shocks? No, these people experienced great distress. In fact, most of them would project to the to the researcher that's telling them to continue on with the experiment that, okay, this is the responsibility lies on you, but the researcher would just always say, um, the, the experiment um, requires that you continue, please go ahead. So the people would complain, they would sweat, they would show great signs of distress, but they would go to the very, very end. Um, which may be surprising to many. So what is our capacity for evil when we get to put ourselves in a bad situation and maybe we have a leader to follow um, that really kind of makes it a bad, bad situation? When we look at the follow-up studies from this, it was, it was done. And we find, you know, there's no difference between men and women as far as how they follow obedience. And, you know, you think about it, this is stuff that we were taught from a very early age. Um, this had this experiment has been recreated with slight changes to make it ethically allowed. I think I believe it was 2004, 2005, and we found the results were very similar. There was slightly less obedience, but yet there was still very similar to Milgram's uh, research, and there was no differences in ages or in gender as far as who were the ones that were obedient. Which also makes us, you know, what about that other 35, 36 percent? or 33%, and you do the math, um, that didn't go along, what about them? And we will look at them when we look at the power of individuals. Um, so when we combine these kind of studies, we can look at ordinary people can be corrupted by an evil situation, for sure. And there are real life examples that maybe you can think of and we can talk of in class that you might know of. 
Okay, so that's the end of part one. And we'll be coming back with part two quite shortly. Make sure you're keeping up. It's not very long till that AP exam. So make sure you're doing review and keeping up with this unit. Okay, bye for now.